about what we do at PM School overall. Right. So at at uh, PM School, we we run a eight week, uh, I would say, condensed boot camp for aspiring product managers to help them un- bridge the gap between knowing what product management is and landing potentially landing their uh, first job as uh, you know uh, an associate product manager or a product manager uh, in software companies. Uh, we've been doing this for the past uh, three years now, and uh, uh, I'm proud to say that we are uh, the most, I would say, followed product management uh, related uh, page on uh, or like community uh, in Asia. Closely followed, uh, you know, we are closely uh, uh, in the same league as uh, product school. Uh, and mind the product uh, in the Asian market. And um, uh, we uh, obviously have uh, these eight week live boot camps, live program uh, running every few, every uh, every month, in fact. Um, and uh, if you're interested, Priyal uh, from my team will be reaching out to everyone after this talk um, to share more details. And uh, please feel free to reach out to us uh, using that email if you have any questions and if you're interested in the PM school program as well. So with that, uh, I will hand over uh, today's session to Akash, who is our star speaker today. Uh, Akash, all over to you. Thank you, Bihal, and namaste, everyone. Uh, I am Akash Purohit, and as you can see, uh, currently I am director of product at UBZ. And UBZ, it's a uh, commercial real it's it works out in uh, commercial real estate tech uh, space. And what we are building right now is a, a SaaS product for uh, developers who build uh, commercial buildings and provide uh, tenant specific solutions which are curated for their employees. So that is something we are building right now. We are in a very nascent stage. We are still in the uh, deciding stage where we are trying to figure out what do we want to include in the MVP part. And that's where I come in with this topic, which is uh, rapid prototyping and how do you go about doing it. Uh, my journey so far has been uh, before this, I was a senior product manager with delivery of our OS1 platform, which is uh, essentially what we are, what we were trying to do was uh, breaking uh, down supply chain into small, smaller chunks and uh, create core essential services services building products on top of them. Uh, before that, I was with Skeps. It was a fintech, sol- fintech uh, organization uh, based out of US. And I was working as a PM2 for Visa and Avant uh, buy and pay later solution. Uh, for, uh, before that, I was a senior product manager with ST Media, wherein I was handling three products. Uh, one was Codathon, second was Olympiad and the third was subscription, uh, which is your print subscription and digital subscriptions on uh, for Hindustan Times. Uh, before that, I was with Room uh, as a group product manager. I was managing uh, two products. One was the entire seller side experience plus uh, dealership management system. And uh, then before that, I worked with uh, Wadi.com and Nephew Labs as a uh, product manager. Uh, my education is I did my um, Bachelor of Engineering from NSIT and my MBA from FMS Delhi. So that in a nutshell is my uh, career so far. And uh, now let's get into the topic of today, which is rapidly validating product ideas. And uh, what are the frameworks and tools that you can use to rapidly validate your product idea? Uh, so l- before we get into what and uh, how of the entire topic, uh, let's understand why do we need uh, our product validation or why do we need to do it? Uh, if you do not know the why, you can you will never accurately arrive at why do, what is the product that you will build and what is it that the, uh, the, the audience will love and get adopted to that product. So uh, the three key, key things here are the that you need to understand the audience needs and uh, you need to understand quickly can you get into the market and how much will it cost you. So there's a famous saying that you do not 
put all three things in one basket, which is your time, effort, and resources. So you have to be very calculative about how much time, how much effort, and how much resource you spend while you are building a prototype. So this is the basis uh, on which you need to uh, base your entire uh, product validation uh, uh, premises. So the entire validation process from here on, it's a, it's, I would call it a cycle, which starts from ideation, wherein you have an idea that uh, you think that it will, it can become a good product and it can actually create some impact for the audience that you think. So what idea comprises of, you know, market trends, it comes from customer needs or understanding your business objectives. Then the second part of it, the, the second step of it is that you do some, some sort of market search wherein you understand the demand, you understand the uh, competition, what are, what, what, what are the competitors in that segment that you have to uh, launch in? And then the, what's, what's going to be your potential customer base? Then when you have collated these, uh, the, the, when you have collected all this data, then you get into the prototyping bit wherein you build a, a quick prototype, a smaller prototype, which can do the bare minimum and you can roll it out for a smaller audience. Then what you do there is the user testing bit, wherein you understand your uh, user's behaviors on your uh, product. You create feedback loops, wherein you constantly keep getting, uh, you know, uh, and then with that uh, feedback, uh, what you do is product. So your first three releases, I would say the, the MLP, the release one and release two are your still uh, your beta releases, wherein you release for the smaller consumer base. And once you have refined your product till the release two, after that, the final version goes out into the market. That's the uh, ideal uh, process to go about it. Now, uh, to do this, there's a, a very uh, famous uh, methodology that has been put into place by Eric Ries, which is Lean Startup Methodology. What it says is you uh, build, you measure, and then you learn and iterate. So in MVP, what do you do? What, you, what is an MVP and what do you do with an MVP? Is that you test your basic business hypothesis, wherein you say, okay, this is my business idea and I want to test it with a consumer base that I know. And then I want to see whether or not should I go out in the market with this product, or maybe I need to pivot if this is not the accurate or the right product, maybe I need to pivot a bit and then do some iterations there and then launch. So <clears throat> this in a nutshell is the uh, lean startup uh, methodology, right? Like you build MVP, you measure your performance and then you learn and then you write. Now, uh, what are the tools for your idea validation? So it says that Utilizing the right tools can expedite and enhance the process of validating your product ideas. Right. Now, basis your product and the segment your product is positioned in, there are different types of uh, tools that are available at your disposal. For example, uh, I, I will give an example with uh, my experience in Hindustan. We were launching a new subscription page wherein we, we had to identify whether or not uh, we had two versions. Uh, I would be, let's call them version A and version B. And these were the uh, new signups for our subscription uh, page. Now we were struggling at that time with the, uh, what do you say, with the uh, subscriptions that the new uh, subscriptions were uh, getting down uh, week on week. So we had to identify key areas where we, we can improve this. So what we did was we created two identical, not so identical uh, pages, wherein we had some sort of uh, visual differences in the two pages. We made them live and we released the two pages for 5% in total for the 10% of traffic, 5% on each page. And then we identified which page gives us uh, the better conversion rate. And we 
consciously took a decision to make it live in a in a single geography which was delhi ncr so that we can accurately call out that uh, geography wise and traffic wise we have identical uh, traffic coming in and so that the results are uh, you know they are not contradictory so when we figured out which page was performing better then slowly it's not like even if once we have the result we completely roll it out then we roll it rolled it out to 25% then we rolled it out to 50% week on week and then we keep on measuring the results and once we had the entire uh, data set which was telling us okay the new page is uh, better that was when we did a full blown uh, market launch for that uh, uh, sign up process uh, sign up uh, uh, these are the tools and I can briefly talk about them. So A-B testing is what I told you about. Now survey tools wherein you can talk about your product, you can ask feedback on, uh, uh, you can ask questions like, uh, okay, what do you want to see in this product? That's where, that's the validation bit. Then page creation tool wherein you just have a simple page which talks about your product uh, on in two, three key uh, uh, points. And then you have a form wherein they can uh, fill in their information and the feedback. Then you have usability testing uh, platforms. Uh, these are the platforms which help you understand the uh, user behavior on your platform. For example, Hotjar. If you install Hotjar on your product, you can clearly see uh, the heat the um, the heat maps wherein you can see where are the most uh, engagements happening on that page. Uh, how where are the users getting stuck? It's a uh, fact that fifty five percent of the products that incorporate usability testing, fifty five percent page such pages saw a much uh, improvement in conversion rates, right? And then data analysis, which gives you insight on how uh, how much of the business objectives or KPIs are being uh, effectively uh, you know uh, met with your product. Now moving on to the second bit of the this process, which is market research and customer discovery. Now before you start the market research. First, you need to decide your objective. Why do you need to do this research? And I would love, like to call out uh, something like this I did in Droom for a product called uh, Droom Dealership Management System. Now, BMS came from, uh, came when I joined Droom and I started looking at our uh, regular KPIs and I figured out that none of the dealers were using our uh, seller uh, you know seller page or the seller dashboard uh, that we had given them to manage their business on room and so i wanted to go out in the market to understand what was happening but then uh, if i would have gone with the problem set on my own then i would have narrowed it down to the problems that i know the problems you give me the solution that was not the uh, process that I wanted to follow, follow. So that was when I decided that I need to understand their business. What are their prob What are the problems they are facing in their current businesses, which is both offline and online. And from there, I wanted to see how much problem our product was solving, and how much of it was we were not even aware of it. So I created a 20, 25 uh, questions, uh, uh, you know, questionnaire, and I went out to three or four, four markets, Preeti, uh, Karol, Bagh, Ludhiana, and Jaipur, which was our, you know, core markets for uh, second-hand automobile dealers. Now, when I went there, <clears throat> after speaking to about uh, five and five or 10 dealers only, within uh, Karol Bar, it was very much clear that the product that we have in place, it does not solve any of the problems for any of the dealers. It far, far away from it. So <clears throat> what I did with that questionnaire was I started gathering insights from smaller, smaller 
uh, information that I could get from interviewing them personally. So information like uh, how many cars do they have uh, on offline versus online? How do they keep track of transactions? And to my surprise, even today, all the transactions that were happening offline, they were recording it in a diary with a pen. That's the kind of bookkeeping we are talking about. And this was in 2018, not even 2010. So uh, in this age, having bookkeeping ledgers in a pen and paper, it was something which was, I thought, uh, was not happening, but it, it was and it still is happening. The second bit was uh, they did not have a they did not have a platform wherein the entire dealer community could come together dig, as a digital community where they could help out each other, uh, and many many such problems uh, I could see. Uh, one of the big problems was there was no uh, they were not keeping KYC information of the people who were buying automobiles from them. So they did not have a DigiLocker kind of software wherein they could keep the information or the identity documents of people who were buying the cars from them. And this led to uh, problems many a times wherein police would come and say, this car was used for some, uh, some mishappenings and you, and it was told to us that you sold it and they did not have any proof, you know, that it was sold by them. So uh, once you know the objective of what you want to achieve with this exercise, it is very it, it becomes very easy for you to identify the questions and arrive at the uh, solution to it. So once you have defined the objective, then you find what's your target audience. So it for B2B kind of business, it is easier to reach your target audience because uh, they are businesses and you can you can easily reach out to them but in b2c it's not the case so that's where your surveys your feedback loops uh they come into picture then you uh <clears throat> have to pick your uh research type so primary research versus secondary research it all depends on the kind of product that you want to build if it's something which is a zero to one product uh there you do not have a lot of uh, market research available. There you have to go out to um, go out in the market and speak to the customers first and and gather their thoughts on uh, whether or not you should build it. Now, uh, one important uh, piece of information I would like to call out here is uh, as a product manager, uh, kindly refrain from believing what your customers are actually telling you, but I would suggest look at what they are doing instead. And this becomes clear from the initial interactions users have with your product. Uh, so that is a way to quantify, accurately quantify your assumptions about the product and its performance. Right. Now moving on to <clears throat> building prototypes. Now, uh, there are two types of uh, products that are available. One are digital, which is on website apps or mobile webs. And there are physical pro physical products like EVs and uh, e-scooters. Now, the prototype building for both of these categories are very, very different. And I will stick to uh, creating products. So we can uh, bifurcate prototypes into two bits. One is one what, what we call as uh, low fidelity prototypes and high fidelity. So low fidelity can be uh, your, you can draw it on uh, paper with a pen, mostly identifying how the process flow will look like, what happens when you click on this city, what happens when you click on this action button, how, how, does, the, how does the user flow happens? Then you share it with the design team, or if you, as a product manager, uh, you there are times when you are required to do the design. Uh, you transfer it into a much better, lower, low fidelity design, and then move move into building a you know a high fidelity design. So. <clears throat> 
what is the use of uh, low fidelity and high fidelity design is that if you have uh, if you are working it working on it yourself let's say if if the team is small and you are low on resources what it gives you is a quick way to uh, change things on the go even if there is development going on the front end you can uh, and it all depends uh, on the complication of the product uh, i'll call it out again and again that the entire framework it is very subjective and it can differ on case to case basis so it does not mean that the entire thing the entire structure you have to follow it as is it is very much subjective right now <clears throat> what happens in a uh, prototype process is you start with low fidelity then you want to high fidelity then you speak to your uh, uh, users you show them designs it can happen that even with uh, uh, with outline you can show your design through a video to your users gather their feedback and work on the prototype itself without launching an mvp whitehead whitehead junior did this for a long time uh before they launched it they had a good feedback loop with their users as well as investors right now uh moving on to uh user testing now <clears throat> what does user testing tell you uh as i mentioned about the hindustan times case it tells you how your product is performing and by performance it means how many users are coming on it and how many users are actually using it so it gives you a good information on of its adoption rate how is how it's uh, how much it is getting adopted how are users loving it are there any feedbacks from the user uh, you have to ensure that there is uh, an adequate uh, feedback loop present in your product for the users to communicate to you that what do they feel that the product is lacking and i would again like to call out here that uh, if they say you know it should work like it rather than looking at uh, what they are saying that it should uh, work like it just identify their actions on the product itself that will give you a much deeper sense and much deeper understanding of their behavior with your product right now <clears throat> the let's say you have a user feedback loop enabled and there are feedbacks coming in so it is always good good feedback some it can be uh, related to user behavior it can be related to compliance it can be related to privacy all of that so it is always uh, beneficial to first categorize your uh, feedbacks and then prioritize them okay for example you pick all the products in the world they will and all the features in that product they will fall into three buckets only so one either it's to increase your consumer base second either it is to increase the revenue or third it either or it's a delight feature now it completely depends on the business objective for that quarter or your users what is it that you are focusing on so your priority from the feedback should tie to the business objective that you are trying to uh, you know achieve in that time or in that uh, uh, quarter now <clears throat> use this feedback keep an iterative process wherein you can quickly get the feedback prioritize it communicate to it to the design team or the development team and get it incorporated now <clears throat> once we have this entire uh, uh, launch la uh, major and iterate uh loop in place how do we say that oh, what is the use of data like why how how do we use data to measure the success so when the first look at the first thing that you did when you were building the prototype 
you had some objectives in mind that you wanted to achieve so you translate those objectives in form of kpis or those kpis then translate into metrics and to achieve those metrics you have tools to see whether or not your uh, product is achieving that those metrics or not because ultimately the product exists to run the business right now tools uh, like google analytics are there wherein you can just see how your funnels are performing how your uh, you know product is uh, serving to a particular uh, geography or a demography or a user base basis that information use that information to see what enhancements you can do in your product so that you keep on improving on uh, within the time time frame that you have decided right now uh, let's i'll talk about a small case study which is dropbox now uh, how dropbox was started was it was all there was already market of cloud storage there so what the uh, founder drew houston do was did was uh, he launched a uh, mvp and mvp not was not even a product it was a video which clearly called out what the product is supposed to do it showed the entire demo that okay uh, you can log in like this you can uh, upload your files like this and this is how this is the space that will be available to you all of that information was clearly available in that video and on the page where this was hosted now the result was uh, thousands of uh, users came in for the beta launch right now basis this information and basis uh, beta version they validated their idea they and they incorporated incorporated the user feedback and then they launched the final product so this is the uh, you know uh, i would say loop that you have to do uh, whenever you have to come up with a you know uh, a new feature or launch a new feature uh what i would say is uh, in product management do not be afraid or do not be apprehensive of taking risks you uh, because uh, and the risk has to be calculated right that you need to know that if i am taking this risk if it goes down south this is my plan b and this is how much i stand to lose if you are a product manager versus if you are a founder the scenarios differ but then uh, the product is your is for you to take care of right it is your thing it is your uh, uh, baby to take care of so this is it now uh, what i would like to demonstrate is a small video uh, wherein you, the entire uh, this conversation uh, how critical it is for you to uh, you know start small and go big uh, i'll just like to um, demonstrate from this video we have met that objective and that sound the bradley armored personnel carrier will bring troops to a combat zone swiftly efficiently and safely it will hold 11 men plus a driver and features a 20 mm cannon which will provide ample firepower and at the same time flexibility and solidly engineered our troops will be arriving at the battlefield in the very finest american technology has to offer and at a million and a half per a real bargain nice work colonel outstanding damn impressive <laughs> In other words, it was designed to be a big taxi cab, drive guys to the battlefield and go back home. Mm -hmm. End up with a turret on top. Mm -hmm. 
Well, this is all well and good, Colonel Smith, but something wrong, General? Well, with this gorilla in production, I don't suppose there's going to be anything left in the budget for my scout. Doubt it, Bob. You don't need scouts. You have radar, air recon, satellites. You always need a scout. And you know what I'm thinking? Why couldn't this thing serve as a scout? But it's a, it's a troop carrier, you know? But this is a speedy vehicle. Why can't it be both? Well, for one thing, it's too big. And for the other, you can't really see out all that much from the side. Sounds like a design flaw to me. Design flaw? Uh, no. no we'll just stick a turret on top with lots of opticals. But then, sir, it, it'll be even bigger. Well, what's your problem, Smith? Not elegant enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the thing is, General, it's kind of hard to do a sneak and peek when you're over 10 feet tall. He's got a point, Bob. Well, all I know is we need a scout. This is fast enough to do the job, and it's funded. Well, um, actually, we're a hair over budget. You turn the Bradley into a scout. We're going to be selling them off to some El Presidente de Chimichunga in no time. Anything for surveillance ends up south of the border before the paint even dries. When you needed that anti-aircraft gun, who backed you up on that? You did, Bob. And who testified to appropriations on behalf of that gun? You did, Bob. I'm talking to appropriations next week. Now, do I sell you on my scout or do I not? You did, Bob. Portholes along the side for individual firearms so the fellows can stick out their guns and shoot people. Good. You know what, Colonel? We already have the turret. We ought to get the biggest bang we can up there. I'm sorry, bang, sir? You can't hurt anybody with that pansy-ass gun. Add on some firepower. <laughs> Where am I supposed to fit the extra ammo? I don't know. Can you just shift things around? Make some room. You already got 4,400 rounds of machine gun ammo. Now you want to add 25 millimeter shells. General wants his ammo. You can't have his ammo. Not unless he runs alongside this thing carrying it. Well, can you just squeeze it in? No. Oh, come on, just squeeze it in. We're not trying on Levi's here, Colonel. Are you telling me that in a vehicle this size, you can't find room for a few rounds of ammunition? Not in its current configuration, no, sir. So the configuration's wrong. There must be something you can dump. Um, sir. Something you don't need. General, the interior is very spare. Besides the ammunition and, and the men, maybe you can leave one of the fellows behind with the ammo where the men go. Sir. It is a troop carrier. So, Make a couple extra drinks. What's the difference? They want a transport that doesn't carry men and a scout that's got a cannon as big as a tank's on it. And portholes. Oh, great, portholes. So the guys can shoot out whatever they can't hit with their cannon. You don't have to buy the damn thing, Jones, just draw it. That's a problem. Why? You go out in the battlefield with this pecker sticking out of your turret, and the enemy's going to unload on you with all they got. Might as well paint a big red bullseye on the side. But it's a troop carrier, not a tank. Do you want me to put a sign on it in 50 languages? I'm a troop carrier, not a tank. Please don't shoot at me. It's going to be so beautiful. That's good work, Smith. Looks perfect to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, General. Looks a little like a tank with that cannon on top. Uh, probably going to draw more fire. Actually, sir, that has come to our attention. We know it's not a tank, but will the other side? I guess we could always thicken the armor, toughen up the hide a bit. Colonel Smith. Could you explain why you put those portholes there? Uh, yes, sir. As per your request, so the men could shoot out um, at the enemy. You're joking, aren't you? Besides portholes, what are we in now, the Navy? <laughs> <laughs> Say, what are you think we could make this thing amphibious? You know, get the troops across a river? No. Uh, no, sir. No. And then... The Bradley's supposed to swim? Nearly, at least. 
amphibious troop carrier slash scout slash tank. Couple more months, I bet they can get this thing to fly. What's this in the margin? Please help me. I am losing my mind. RLS. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Laurel Smith, Head of Oversight and Development. Aluminum. Thing's got an aluminum skin. Huh? Anything an enemy tank fires at is gonna go through it like a hot knife through butter. We're doing the specs on using steel rather than aluminum. Of course, steel is much heavier than aluminum, so it won't go as fast. No, we can't lose speed. We lose speed, it won't work as a scout vehicle. We can't keep pace with M1 tanks either. Thicker armor's a reactive measure. Let's think proactive here. I say equip the thing with anti-tank missiles. Then it can blast those enemy tanks before they get a chance to fire. What do you think, Colonel? Fine. Anti-tank missiles? I don't know. Where do I put them? The men will have to wear the missiles as hats. I don't know, Jones. That's why you get paid the big bucks. Colonel, there's no room. We're not talking about, about a pair of Levi's. I know, I know! God damn it! What we are talking about is 11 years with nothing to show for it. Except that also the size of the District of Columbia and a career that's on permanent hold. You see this? I've been, I've been a bird colonel so long, I swear I'm going feathers. Now, if you have the design hats to hold those goddamn missiles, then just do it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, please, if you'd all just take your seats. Thank you. We are pleased. A scale model of the new Bradley fighting vehicle. Bradley is outfitted with the most sophisticated surveillance equipment ever developed. It is also equipped with a rapid fire cannon and an anti tank rocket launcher. Which means it's loaded with 1,500 shells, 10 tow anti tank missiles. So, in summation, gentlemen, what you have before you is a troop transport that can't carry troops, a reconnaissance vehicle that's too conspicuous to do reconnaissance, and a quasi-tank that has less armor than a snowblower, but has enough ammo to take out half of DC. Fantastic, congratulations. We have met that objective and then some. Yeah. So uh, you guys saw how uh, the entire uh, product was started how the uh, what was the objective and how over time it got changed into you know from making it a troop carrier to making it something which had everything but it was not doing anything correctly right so it measures it is uh, i would say it is our uh, duty to stand by what stand by the objective of what our product is supposed to do and business management users, they will always, always push you to, you know, do or create products which serve their need. But what 
we as product managers stand for is to build products that create impact that solve the problem correctly efficiently keeping in mind the uh, business objectives that we have to meet right so uh, with that i would uh, you know uh, stop here and uh, will uh, kushal and i will take questions if there are any thanks akash uh, that was quite an insightful presentation and uh, content shared uh, we have a few we have time folks so please keep dropping in your questions in the chat uh, section uh, although we have a few questions uh, which i have addressed uh, but maybe i'll pose them to you again akash so how much background okay this is a generic product management manager question how much background or need of coding is required for for, for being a product manager okay actually i have never coded uh, but what i can tell you is uh, i'll tell you who makes the best product managers and it's actually the people who have sales background i tell everybody this uh, if you want to be a great product manager have a sales mindset because we as product managers we have a very critical mindset we see thing we see edge cases we try to see edge cases we try to cover everything in one go right but what what a sales mindset has is it has the ability to cut through the negatives and post your positives like anything and coding is not required what is required is number one the knowledge of i would say an eye for user behaviors or understanding of data that is the most important thing i would say and stakeholder management because in okay so if uh, i would say product management as 100% a pie 80% of it will go into stakeholder management regardless of the organizations that you are in everybody and because product manager is one for the product it is never like you work as a team you never work as a team you you own the product on your own right so you are always alone and you are facing management you are facing your users you are facing the business team you are facing the development team you are facing the design team and you have wear different hats when you communicate with each of them so with business you talk about business with coders you talk about uh, you know in uh, in coding language uh, what api is what data parameter what data points compliant with legal also you have to talk in uh, talk about compliance data privacy api privacy and all of that so coding is a very a, a small subset of small knowledge subset that you should have but that does not mean you should know coding you should know what the product is supposed to do that's it that's all you need to know and that's all that goes into making a uh, product requirement document thanks akash uh we have one more question on feedback being posed by piyush so uh, how do we ensure the feedback collected during validation process is accurately analyzed and translated into actionable insights a very good question okay. so uh, i would say uh, so what we product managers sometimes we fail to do is we fail to understand the difference between data driven and data informed right now in for feedback also i would say this feedback driven versus feedback informed now when i say feedback driven it means you have feedback you just take it and you create jira tickets and you assign it to development developers that without even analyzing that what the feedback is supposed to say and when you say that feedback is accurately analyzed that is your job or that is our job as the product managers to do this to carry out this exercise 
nobody else is going to do or if you say that there is a data analytics team or there is a i would let's say there is some team which is working on this so what they tell you again i'll tell you do not go on words see actionable quantifiable items which are present in the feedback do not go by the word let's say they say that uh, this uh, button is confusing okay so the button is confusing what is what about the button is confusing the position or the content on the button the is it not doing what it's supposed to do what is it about the button that is confusing right that is where you have to uh, get down to and you have to also understand that if there is a problem and let's say there are hundreds of feedbacks i they will uh, if there is a problem there will be at least let's say uh, 10% or 20% feedbacks pertaining to that particular problem so if some any problem is an outlier do not pick it unless it is it happened for a particular person but it is breaking your that's uh, a compliance so you have to look out for those kind of feedbacks but let's say if it's a common problem and it's happening for all the users you have to then see through user testing or behavior testing through hotjar or you know crazy act heat maps video recordings what is happening try the product yourself see if you are facing the same problem what is it about that audience that they are facing that problem for example let's say in a checkout flow there is a problem with a particular bank hdfc bank and not with kotak and people are saying that transactions are failing so you have to go down to look at all the failures cause of failure why is it failing is it failing for all banks is it failing for just one bank drill down to that level of uh, you know clarity so that is how you have to you know keep an eye for accurate testing of uh, feedbacks thanks akash uh it's a follow up question from a previous uh, question we just was asked is user testing done after we create wireframes or is it in the beginning phase too completely depends it entirely depends so let's say uh let's say you are building a uh, any product let's say any let's say if you are building a for example let me think of an example uh let's say you are building a new uh, wearable watch right a, a, a fitness tracker now the i would say if it is up to me if, if i am designing it what i'll do is i'll launch the page which has the not the actual product but a uh, a visual representation of the product of how it will look like all the features mentioned how is it better than fitbits and garments and apple i watches what problem is this product trying to solve i'll create a small uh, sign up for beta or early bird you know kind of form wherein i would try to see how many people have this has this form reached out to let's say 100 people or let's say 1000 people have seen this page this information i'll get from google analytics and how many people have signed up for it now let's say if i have 100 people signed up for it that's 10% conversion that's a beautiful beautiful number for me that if 1000 people are looking at it without having an actual product i can accurately say that the problems that i'm trying to solve or i have in my mind to solve 100 people are interested in that uh product that solves this particular for example let's say if uh, they, uh, none of the watches measure bp blood pressure right they give you heart rate they give you beats uh, uh beats per minute but they don't measure your bp right which is like let's say 120 by 80 it's on 
BP reading. Now let's say I build, I, uh, I, I have a tech which can do this on a um, watch. Now I want to see how many people are interested in this particular product. So I can also include, like, let's say, which product, which feature in this watch interests you the most? Is it pulse rating? Is it BP rating? Is it uh, steps counting? All of that. So which pro which feature stands out BP? Now I want to see if this tech is making sense to the people I'm launching it for. And then I launch this page and I bring in traffic to of that particular audience. And this can happen through your SEOs. This can happen through your performance marketing. This can happen through your affiliate marketing. And from there you can see that the audience that you are targeting, how much they are interested in this particular feature, right? So it gives you a direction on whether or not you should spend your time, money, and uh, effort into this. We have a lot more questions coming in uh, mm -hmm. from LinkedIn. Uh, how do you understand what would be a good mode of MVP or how how would you define whether an MVP is good uh, for a software product or a video clip, etc. Essentially, how do you bound or bind the definition of it? Okay. So MVP is, uh, okay, in this case, I'll, Kushal, I'll talk about UBZ a bit, right? Now, uh, what happened is, in UBZ, we have, we have a lot of features that we want to build in in the course of next two years. But from developers for whom we are solving, for whom we are solving this problem, we got a feedback, okay, out of these, these are the four features that we want to do solve for. And this survey we did for from about, you know, I know uh, seven, eight uh, prominent developers. And we showed them what all features we have that we want to you know, build. And we asked them that, what would you like our product to have first? Because uh, if we are to go live in three or four months, uh, we cannot have everything. So tell us what do you want us to solve first? So we took this feedback from, uh, let's say, seven or eight uh, key developers. Because for us, they are our customers or users. Now from that feedback we collated okay so these are the four pro four features in the product that we have to have these four are the must have now each of those features will have sub features right now your definition of mvp comes down to what all sub features your product should have now for example you have a sign up process then you have a dashboard and then you have a, let's say, a payment uh, which is to be done for, to, for something, for example. And then you have a payment gateway integration, right? Now, to go from A to B, what all sh should be present in that flow that can have your user go through the entire cycle and complete that objective that or solve the problem that you are trying to solve. So sign up. Okay. So you decide, okay, I, I want to have a, a sign up via phone. Now sign up via phone means you need to send an OTP. So, okay. I'm not taking emails. So I will not send OTP on email. I will only send OTP via SMS. Right. So this is the MVP for your uh, sign up process. Then on dashboard, what all information do you want to show? Okay, I don't want the user to edit anything. So no setting section. I I just want to show a section wherein the product is available and the buy now uh, um, city is there. So that bare minimum information. Now clicking on that buy now, it directly um, it directs the user to the third party payment gateway, you do not have it in build. So that's the MVP for your buy now process. So MVP in itself is MVP of sub features, 
right that you are trying to launch and you cut, cut that down to the bare minimum so uh, this comes down to first principles thinking that how do you solve for this for example if you want to don't have the budget to get ga installed or you don't have the resources to get ga installed what you do is you you see uh, how many how much traffic is coming in through your uh, back end data and you see how much sign up is how much how many people are buying the product so from there you get the conversion rate right so mvp is there in everything in every aspect of the entire product there are mvps there they, it will never happen that you will have an entire product and every thing for product is like no that that never happens you, you are always iterating for that product you are building sub features sub features sub features for that product because you need to iterate you need to keep optimizing for example if you see paytm flow jahan par aap wallet mein paise add karte ho wo saal dar saal unka ui change hota hai wo kyun hota hai because they 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 read data they take feedbacks and it is not something like we are giving them feedback ki nahi ye page kharab hai ye page acha hai they are analyzing it right and they are continuously monitoring how we are interacting with that page wahan pe kaun sa payment method pehle aana chahiye kaun sa baad mein aana chahiye kya dikhna chahiye kya nahi dikhna chahiye it is all analysis so mvp is always there it's just that where you are with your products journey are you just launching then your entire product is mvp and plus your sub features or features and sub features are also mvp and with bit time you keep on prioritize you prioritize okay what i want to launch next what i want to improve next i hope that answers this question here yeah. absolutely uh correct right. So we have one more question. How do I strike a balance between speed and thoroughness and validating product ideas? What metrics or indicators should I track to determine success? Okay, so, of, uh, so yeah. I think he's uh, the 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 person is trying to talk about trade off on quality versus uh, speed. Speed. Right? Now, uh, <clears throat> depends. It entirely depends, and uh, never ever. compromise on quality of the product never do that people will push you including your management it will say that you know we need and we need to have this uh, uh product live in two days so it, it happens uh i have never in my 10 years of career i have never had a time wherein i could say that i had enough time to launch this product that has never happened right but then you also stand because who you are representing you are representing the users you are the users voice in the organization which is trying to launch a problem which is solving for the customers right so you have to identify key things that a user should be aware of in terms of communication in terms of process in terms of usability and then you have to strike a balance okay even if i uh, reduce this uh, let's say i have two modes of communication sms and email okay how many smss are being read versus how many emails are being read if emails are a uh, more and i have to reduce cost i can do away with the sms thing and i can add a simple uh, content on my email that you know we are doing away with the sms kindly look at the email part Uh, for uh, will communicate uh, via email in all our further correspondence so you have to be very transparent with all the stakeholders and for most importantly with your customers one question um are there any special tools or software that you recommend for conducting quick market validation quick market validation okay so uh depends so if you are so i would say uh, survey forms are if you are launching a digital product i would say survey forms are the best way uh a beginner ga google analytics installed on your page 
wherein you can see uh, the traffic that is coming in. You can bifurcate it by region, by demography, by geography, everything. And you can create a funnel which says, okay, uh, let's say there are uh, in a in a feed in a survey tool, I would say there are only two steps. One is land on uh, landing on the page versus filling up the form. Now, uh, how many people are landing versus how many people are filling the form? I think it's it's, it's a good met metric to trace on uh, two. Uh, two. So here are there are two things that you have to uh, measure here. One is either uh, whether your product is something in which people are interested in. And second, is the page efficiently handling the traffic? For example, it can also happen that people are unable to fill in the form because it is loading the form too late. Then you have to go and deep dive into the technical aspect of it, wherein you check yourself whether the page is loading fine or not. Is it loading in, let's say, two to three seconds? It's it, there's a good delay there. So then you have to identify these two things, whether the product is making waves to the audience, which is, or to the traffic, which is coming in. And that you can easily see by the conversion rate of your uh, signups. And for signups, you can use Google forms. You can use, uh, what's that called? Monkey surveys. Survey monkey. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, something which Shaka has already answered, Yush. So, what are the common challenges and obstacles you've encountered in validating product ideas? How do you overcome them? Uh, I would say the biggest prop the biggest challenge i have faced is uh, people don't know what they want it is and it is true henry ford mentioned it uh, product leaders have <laughs> called it out again and again kushal is smiling he agrees with me i know and this is a challenge that we face time and again that people do not actually know don't know what they want until and unless you show it to them so if you have a prototype with you to show it to users, even if it's a, if it's a physical product and you have a digital prototype for it, which shows okay. Let's say you have a time machine, right? You want to build a time machine. You figured out a way to uh, bend time and space. Now you have a physical. You don't have a physical model, but you want to raise funds or you want to get people on board so that they are interested in the product. You can explain them the entire theory behind it, the entire science behind it. You can show them how it will look like that will garner interest right rather than you spend your and this is a i got this quote from a, a, a professor in iit who used to say never put all three in one bucket which is your time money and resources you can have two in one bucket but never three so <clears throat> so always always keep in mind that uh, you know you have a prototype with you which clearly communicates the problem that you are trying to solve the communication that is going out with the prototype the communication that is there that is super simple to understand uh, always be mindful of the fact that the people will understand 50 percent of what you are trying to communicate as simple as possible uh, a product leader, I, I have read this, that if you can't explain your product to a five-year-old, you do not know it yourself. So make it that simple. The communication has to be that simple that ABCD, it does this. It has to be that simple. Cool. I think uh, we've run out of uh, time. Uh, folks, if you have any additional questions, you can engage with us on our LinkedIn channel uh, against the same event. Please add your comments there tag us and uh, we'll answer your questions uh, uh, asynchronously uh, 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 you know on LinkedIn and if uh, there's some questions specific to the role of product manager and how to transition between product management um, we have shared uh, Priya has shared uh, contact details uh, in the chat section please make a note of it and uh, please reach out to us uh, you know uh, to Priya and uh, anyone from our team 
uh, and we'll be happy to address any questions you have as well as uh, help uh, give you or share more information about the uh, PM school program as well. So yeah, I think same question, same uh, pointed to you as well, uh, Harshit. Uh, if you have, <laughs> these questions are uh, something which we uh, deal with on uh, on a day to day basis, you can uh, address them directly to Priyal or someone from the PM school team. And we'll be happy to answer any number of questions to help you transition into becoming uh, product managers. And uh, with regards to today's session, Akash, again, um, it was a great overall Thank experience. Thank you. Thank Lots you of learnings. for inviting me. Uh, it, it's a pleasure, Akash. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining with uh, joining us today. Mm -hmm. um, with that, uh, we will end today's session. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we'll have the recording up uh, on LinkedIn and YouTube, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll, you'll receive uh, details of the next uh, program or next start session very soon in a couple of weeks just so with that um, yeah just one sure, thing, I, I it just came into my mind uh one last uh you know food for thought is uh always keep an eye on, uh, on different industries for example if even if you are working in uh e-commerce uh keep your mind open to what is happening in different industries because an idea can can come from one industry and it can transpire into creating value into a different industry altogether. So always, always, always keep an, uh, keep an open mind for that experimentation as well. For example, Netflix is a big, big, uh, you know, example for this, that uh, the subscription idea came from subscription of the gym to the founder that I can use the subscription uh, bit apply or apply it into the movie business and look where it uh, has brought Netflix and not just Netflix, everybody's, you know, uh, jumping on the train together. Yep. Yeah. True. So yeah, that's the last food for thought. Thanks, Akash. Thanks for sharing that. All right, folks. Thanks All so much thank again. You. Uh, thank, thank you, you Akash. Uh, and uh, hope to see you in the next session very soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.